Good morning. Trust you are doing all right this morning. We're in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15. Luke, chapter 15. And in a sense, continuing with the theme that we have been focusing on, uh, that Bill has introduced us to this morning, Luke chapter 15. And any time that someone asks you to go to Luke chapter 15, you know that there are three stories there, and those three stories all have to do with things that were lost and then were found. Things that were lost and then were found. Luke chapter 15. I invite you just to bow your heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, will you bless us as we consider these well-known parables. May we get something from these messages for our hearts, Lord, as we meet with you, that you would speak to us in a personal way, that you would speak to us not only in an individual and personal way, but as a congregation, as a body, that we might share your burden of seeking and saving the lost. Will you help us, Lord? And open our minds at this time and bless us with the presence and the visitation of your Holy Spirit. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This uh, chapter starts off in a very interesting way. It uh, is mostly taken up with words in red, indicating it's a discourse spoken by Jesus and recorded by the Bible author. But the first part, the first three verses, give us the background. They are the words in black. And they give us the situation. They give us the information that help us to put the discourse of Jesus in the right context. And it is most interesting. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable to them. Pause. So, the Bible in verse 3 indicates that it is so he spoke this parable to them. His response of the three parables is directly related to the thoughts and perhaps even to the mutterings and the murmurings that he may have overheard in the crowd that day of the scribes and the Pharisees. And the Bible starts off this chapter with telling us who it was that felt drawn to Christ. And it's interesting that the scribes and the Pharisees are not mentioned explicitly in that group. Now, it is apparent that they were in the crowd because they were there to murmur and mutter, right? But the Bible mentions that it is the sinners, the publicans, the the tax collectors, the lowest of the low, those whom the scribes and the Pharisees looked down on, those who the scribes and the Pharisees maintained a very definite professional distance from, so as not to become contaminated, so as not to be drawn into being guilty by association even. Those people that were really without hope in the world because they were written off by the religious crowd. They were written off by the church leaders. There was no hope for them. No one wanted anything to do with them. They didn't measure up to, to, to the religious stature of those in charge of the church. It was this type of crowd that felt drawn to Jesus. Which is interesting because you would think that the church is the place that we come to meet with Jesus. You would think that those in the position of trust, those in the position of leadership, such as the scribes and the Pharisees, that they would reflect or or emanate the same sort of atmosphere, the same sort of drawing, inviting presence that Jesus himself, as the head of the church, the one who brought the church into existence, without whom the church has no purpose and no reason for existence, you would think that those in leadership of such a body of people would exude and illuminate the same sort of atmosphere as the one who they would supposedly be working on behalf of. Is that a fair assumption? And yet they are the ones that are repulsed by the very ones that are drawn to Christ. Very, very interesting contrast that's pictured here. And I've got to ask the question, how, do that, how, do that, how does that type of people, that category of people, how do they feel when they come in and join with the body of Christ in the experience of worship? 
They may be drawn to Christ. They've heard some stories. They have experienced some sort of religious awakening in their heart. There's just a flicker of a hunger or of a thirst, or maybe even a very deep hunger and thirst. Just a flickering of hope comes up in their lives, and they think, I know that church is the place where people go to meet with this Jesus. I've tried everything else. I've exhausted my human resources. I've tried every methodology. I've drunk and I've eaten at the wells of the world and at the tables of the world, I have not found a satisfaction for my hunger. Perhaps, perhaps by chance, if I've tried everything this world offers and it has not satisfied me, then perhaps by chance, the one thing I thought would never satisfy, this religious thing, this spiritual thing, this, this, this Jesus thing, this Bible thing, this prayer thing, this alien, foreign, outside of myself, not used to it thing, maybe this one thing might satisfy my soul. Especially since everything else hasn't that promised it would. And so they walk in the front doors. And you are the first person they see. What is their first impression? What is their first impression? Spoken to the scribes and the Pharisees who were, yes, the leaders of God's church, but you do not have to be a leader to be a scribe or a Pharisee in attitude. And it is to this mindset, it is to this context that Jesus speaks these three parables. The first one is of a sheep. A sheep. Now, my, my daughters adopted two lambs, which were only able to stay with us for a grand total of about two weeks before we realized it wasn't going to work. <laughs> But one thing I realized is that while sheep or lambs are fairly loving, they are not the brightest of creatures. And so the story is told of a lamb, a sheep, who gets separated from the flock and is lost. It cannot find its way home. It is lost. And as the shepherd leads his sheep home, and as he leads them into the, into the quarters where they sleep, into their little fenced-in area, he does what he does every night. He takes the time to count the sheep because every sheep is precious to the shepherd. Now, in those days, you will, of course, understand that culturally this made a lot more sense in, the, in that the whole methodology of shepherding was very different to the modern, present-day New Zealand methodology of sheep, uh, sheep herding. There were no dogs to bite at the ankles. There were no quad bikes to chase them along. The shepherd formed a personal relationship with his sheep. They, they heard his voice. They knew his call. And we get this idea from John chapter 10 where this idea of Jesus being the good shepherd is again used as the illustration. And he speaks about them, that his sheep know his voice and they follow him. Because in those days, the shepherd would call and he would walk in front of the sheep. He didn't have to force them along. He didn't have to coax them along. He didn't have to bite at their heels. He didn't have to make loud noises. He didn't have to shout. They simply trusted the shepherd because the shepherd had never let them down before. And so the sheep would hear his call, and they know that the shepherd's job is to protect them from danger, that the shepherd's job is to lead them into the green pastures, to make them lie down by the cool waters, and they would trust the shepherd, and they would follow his voice. And so this sheep somehow from this flock gets separated and gets lost, and as the shepherd that night stands at the entrance to the little, to the little uh, the, the pen where he's going to keep the, the sheep, and he counts off those sheep, 100 is supposed to be there, but how many are there? Only 99. And perhaps the shepherd, to make sure, does another count, and he realizes there is, in fact, one sheep missing. Now, the reality is, what is one sheep amongst 100? You know what I mean? I mean, 100 sheep, really. Next season, you get 100 or more, more, you know, extra. What's one sheep? It's late. It's getting dark. There's dangers out there. All those nocturnal beasts are coming out. But that's exactly what motivates the shepherd. 
Not the sense of his own comfort, not the desire for his own sleep. He's been out in the fields all day. He's been walking, he's been taking care of, he's been protecting, he's been watching. And at the end of the day, it's the stupid sheep's fault anyway. The sheep's only getting what he deserves, isn't he? I mean, you all know you listen to the voice of the shepherd. You all know you follow this sheep crowd when the shepherd calls. One stupid little sheep. Got to go and do his own thing. And the shepherd says what? I'll forego my night of sleep. Although I've had a long day and I've got another long day tomorrow. No sleeping in for farmers, right? And so he goes out that night looking for his sheep. Seeking to save, to bring home. He calls out in the darkness, waiting to listen. Calls out that way. Let, the, let, the, let the, the waves of the wind carry the sound. Calls out this way. Calls out that way. Walks a little further. Retraces the steps of that day. And then that evening as he's calling out late at night, in the still of the night, he just hears the faintest cry somewhere. And the Savior hears even the faintest cry of the heart. Not even prayed, not even spoken out loud. Just the first inkling of the desire for something better. The shepherd hears the cry of the heart. And he calls out. And the sheep responds. And as the, Savior draws close to the, as, as the shepherd draws close to the, the sheep, the cries get louder. And more and more distinct. And so too as the Savior seeks those who are lost. As he hears that first faint cry of the heart. And he responds by calling back. If the soul responds to him. He draws nearer. And every time there's this reciprocation of call and response. And call and response. The two grow closer and closer. The heart of the shepherd growing in joy and anticipation. The heart of the sheep growing in hope and expectation. Until eventually the two are reunited. And then the parable says that the shepherd, having been reunited with that lost sheep, gives him what for and tells him his fortune. Not quite. Not quite. As the story goes, verse 5, when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. He lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. He's not angry. He's not upset. Because the joy of the rediscovery has blacked out the remembrance of the time of pain and inconvenience. He rejoices and he carries it on his shoulders. A picture of tenderness. A picture of love. A picture of one who bears no resentments and no grudges. The past is forgotten. He's just glad to have his sheep back. And he puts it on his shoulders. So that cold body of that sheep, almost dead from hypothermia, can begin to be warmed by the joy of his own heart, the warmth of his own body. And he begins to make way, the way home to the sheepfold. And I wonder to myself as I read this, the shepherd has been calling and seeking the lost. The lost who are lost and know they're lost. And that inkling of their heart begins to respond. And finally, finally, he, that, that lost sheep walks in through the front door on a Sabbath morning. It's taken guts. It's taken courage. It may be someone who once walked with us and now has been gone for a long time. And they finally walk in through those front doors. And they're expecting what? Judgment? They're concerned, maybe, about the evil eye look, the look of suspicion. Finally, the shepherd and the sheep are to be reunited. And God forbid that you and I would be the obstacle that stands before that joy, between that joyful reunion. Do you and I share the burden of souls with the shepherd? Do you and I have a hungering and a thirsting to seek and to save the lost? Because if we do not share that burden, then we do not know what it is to be a Christian. 
For a Christian is one who is filled with a selfless disinterest in themselves. And the motivation for others that the Savior who left heaven above to come down looking for this one little planet in the vast universe of worlds out there that are safely in the fold. He leaves the glories of heaven and he comes down here in an act of selfless, selflessness to seek and to save the one world that is lost. The one soul that comes in lost. Do we represent that Savior's attitude, that Savior's compassion, that Savior's love, that Savior's rejoicing that finally the shepherd and the sheep are reunited? Or are we the one that stands ready to chastise? Oh, and it doesn't have to happen, obviously. Of course, none of us are going to admit to being that person. I mean... We all respect ourselves more than to admit to something as foolish and as ignorant as that. But what about the body language? What about the looks? What about what we say that we think they can't hear? As a pastor, I can tell you horror stories of stuff that happens in the foyer. Some of which I've seen other places in the world and some of which I've seen firsthand in New Zealand. And I ask us as a congregation, I ask us as individuals, do we share the burden for the lost? Because if you share the burden for the lost, I'll tell you what, it doesn't matter what they look like when they come in that door. It doesn't matter where they've been, what they've done, even if it was a personal offense to me what they did. The fact that they're coming in those doors is their heart responding to the call of the shepherd. And we should rejoice that they are here. We should rejoice that every single one of us are here. And there is always space for one more. Always. Whatever the background. Wherever we come from. However far we have fallen. And the one who doesn't grasp this, ironically, being at home in the fold, the one who doesn't grasp this is the one that is in fact in more danger of being lost than the one who's walked in the door looking like a ruffian. Because it indicates a heart not touched by the grace of God. It indicates a heart filled with pride and self-sufficiency. And pride is the sin that God hates most, for it is the most incurable of all sins, for it senses no need. At least the drug addict or the prostitute or what you would imagine in your mind is the worst of the worst, the low of the low, the fallen of the fallen. At least there's that heart's desire inside and they are responding, but the sin of pride marches itself around in the presence of God himself and has no sense of its own need. In the presence of God, lost. In 2011, the leadership of this church intends for us to focus on reaching out to the community. In 2011, we hope and we pray that coming in through those doors will be a lot more of the type who might, on the appearance of things, take us out of our comfort zone. Not sure if we can trust that type. You know what I mean? Keep your purse close to you. Don't smell so good. Smell like all the stuff they've been smoking outside. Walk around looking more like Christmas trees than people. Stuff they wear is just not really becoming of people that come to church. But the church is here for those people. That's exactly why the church exists. 
And don't you forget it that you and I, but for the grace of God, we go there. In fact, some of us came up out of that world ourselves. The preacher amongst those. Why are we here as a church? You know, it's an amazing thing. The work of salvation is so awesome that you and I very quickly forget where we came from. After a few years, we forget the loneliness. We forget the alienation. We forget the brokenness. Praise God for that. I mean, that's the experience of salvation. We find a new family. We find fellowship. We get comfortable in our friendship circles. We even become cliquish at times. So comfortable that we found our place that we call home. And it even becomes difficult for us to relate to those who are still where we once were. Where we were hungering, where we were thirsting, where we were broken, where we were alienated, where we were lonely. And when they come in the front doors, it is, it is sometimes difficult for us to even remember what we needed when we came in those doors. And if you were one of those unfortunate people that stuck it out, even although you did not have the ideal welcome, then you have been trained through trial to not be that person. Then you have been trained to know what not to do. And you have been equipped to share the burden of souls with the Savior. I say to you that likewise, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. And this was the scribes and the Pharisees. They felt as if they needed no repentance. And then Jesus uses another analogy. The sheep had an inkling that it was lost. But the coin knew nothing. And so Jesus tells of a coin that gets lost in the muck and the rubbish of the home. And in those days in Palestine, of course, you know, you and I go home to our homes this afternoon and we have these big windows in front of, see out onto the yard, all the light comes in. That's not how they built homes back then. They were dark, they were dingy, and even in the broad light of the day, there were often in the poorest of homes no windows. You needed a lamp even during the day. And so as a result, it was easy for the house to become dirty. You know, you didn't see the dirt. It was, it was always dark and dingy in there. It was like living in, in the dark of night all the time. You didn't, you didn't have to sweep because you didn't think it was dirty. And so this lady has lost a coin. And so she lights a lamp and she goes around sweeping the house. She puts great effort into it because she recognizes the value of that coin. She's a poor woman. And perhaps that coin was part of a wedding present that was given. And in those days, these wedding presents were given pieces of silver and coins and so on, almost like a dowry, if you like. And then these things were passed on as a legacy to the next generation. Sometimes like grandmothers and mothers passed down their wedding ring or their engagement ring from mother to daughter, from mother to daughter and so on. And so this lady goes around and she starts sweeping the house. The coin has no knowledge that it is lost. It is happy where it is. It's lost amongst the muck of the house. It's lost in the house. As it is possible for people in the family of God to be lost and have no sense of their lostness. But she searched for that coin. She searched until she found it. Mothers and fathers, do not assume that your children are saved. Do not assume that because you have a relationship with Christ and a real experience with Christ that your children in your household within the family of God automatically grow up to accept Jesus and be saved. And do not assume that the pastor or the Sabbath school worker will do a sufficient job to ensure that they are saved. There is a responsibility given to every parent to seek and save that which is lost within the household. Light the word which is a lamp unto our feet. Let the word illuminate the home. Remove the influences that tend towards lostness. Seek and save that which is lost. Every parent is an evangelist. Every parent is called to the work of soul winning. 
If you have a child, the Lord has blessed you with that child, not merely to enjoy the first few steps, to hear those wonderful words spoken, which they always speak first, Daddy. Not just to see them go off to school for the first day. Not just to be there for their first heartbreak. Not just to be there to put the first band-aid on the first knee that gets scuffed when they fall. All the adventures of parenthood in this life. Are they a blessing? Praise God. Yes, they are a blessing. But you and I as parents are called to the work of soul winning. For what shall it profit a mother and a father if they gain a horde of children but none of them enter the kingdom of heaven? Now, there are things beyond our control. But every parent is a soul winner. And do not assume, even if you are not a parent or whether you are a parent, that just because there are young people in our church today, that they're all on the path to heaven. Let each of us be a mentor to a young person. Not that person who when they see you in the foyer on a Sabbath morning, they do their best to avoid you. Because something's going to be said about whatever. The model for Christ. And then the last parable which you know well. Two boys, one family, same father. Same environment, same influences. One stays at home. The other says to his father, I wish you were dead. I want my inheritance. A few days later, he goes packing with all of his dad's wealth. He squanders it. Riotous living. Hanging out with the wrong crowd. Thinks he's got it all together. He's found freedom. He's arrived. He's autonomous. And to him, this is the definition of freedom. Doing what I want, where I want, with whom I want. No one to get in my way. No more restrictions of the laws and the rules of the father's home. Just living it up. Doing what I want. And he quickly realizes in a far country that when the money runs out, so does the fun. When the money runs out, all those good friends that were going to stand by you are gone. You're left alienated alone. And so this boy, just like many of us, reach a point where he's hit rock bottom, where he realizes autonomy is not freedom, it's slavery. That ironically, being a law unto myself, doing what I want, when I want, is not actually freedom, but it places me in a, a place eventually where I am trapped and I cannot get out. And so he turns and he heads back home. I want you to know that with all of these stories, it is always the initiative Of God that goes looking and seeking. In the first story, it's the shepherd. In the second story, it's the woman who goes looking for the coin that cannot find itself. And you think, well, in the third story, it's the boy. It's his initiative. No. This was the boy. He was in church. He was in home. At home. He knew the goodness of the Father. He walked with the faithful for some time. And then he got attracted by the things of this world. The story of many Adventist young people. The story of my own life. And so he deliberately leaves the home and he goes out there and it takes him to hit rock bottom before he realizes that all that stuff that was advertised in the world was just that. It was an advertising campaign. It does not bring the true reward. You know, you've seen those adverts on TV, right? You know the Lynx deodorant advert? If you just stand on the beach and spray this deodorant on yourself, women in their hordes will come over the hills to get hold of you. You know that advert, right? Ever sprayed links? Doesn't work. Sorry, guys. It's not going to work. And the attractions of sin are like the advertising campaign of the devil. 
He makes it look grand on the television of the imagination. He makes you believe that if I can just get hold of this object of my sinful desire, I will have arrived. I'll find contentment. I'll find joy. I'll find peace. And this religious stuff, this God stuff, this Bible stuff, it's a curtailment of my freedom. It's not going to do it for me. What I need to be is over there. And off we go. We head out the back door. And boy, do we rejoice in our freedom at first because we still have our health. We still have our outward beauty. We still have our talent. We still have the strength of our intellect and of our mind. We still have everything going for us. And after a while of living righteously, we squander all of those God-given gifts until we reach a place where we have none of that left. And all of a sudden we look around and we are bankrupt. And we have nothing. Nothing. And it's at that point where we realize autonomy is not freedom. It's the destiny of slavery. And so the boy returns home. You think it's the initiative of the boy? No, it's not. It was the fact that he had seen the goodness of the father before. And when he is in the place of squalor, in the place of the pigsty, when he's wanting to eat the, the, the food of the pigs and everyone has abandoned him and he's empty and he's lonely and he's isolated, he remembers the goodness of the father that he beheld before. It is always the initiative of God by which the lost are saved. He remembers the character and the atmosphere of the home. And he can see through his choices where he is now. And he turns and he heads back to the father. You see, the father is standing on the porch waiting and looking. And you know the story. He sees the son and the father leaves his, his Middle Eastern dignity behind. And he runs to meet his son who is clothed in rags, who smells like the pigs. Is that you and I in the foyer? Are we willing to leave our Christian dignity behind? Or like the scribes and the Pharisees, do we like to hold ourselves aloof for fear of defilement? Are you seeing a picture of the Father God's heart for the lost? For lost things, for lost people? And I'm asking you, do we have that heart in us? Because if we don't, we do not know the true experience of once I was lost, but now I am found. When you have tasted what it's like to be found from the depths of lostness, man, it changes your attitude. Changes your attitude. Changes your outlook. And it changes the way you deal with others who are still in that place of lostness. Do we have the Father's heart for the lost? But here's the interesting thing. After the reun re reunion with the Father, while the boy is still about to beg to be made a servant, a slave in the household, knowing that he's not worthy of being in the household... The father cuts him off and puts him, his robe around him. You know the symbolism of that, being clothed with the righteousness of Christ. You and I don't deserve anything, not even to be the slaves of God in heaven. And yet he has exalted us in adopting humanity, forever to be reunited with us, to ever, to, forever to, to share in our humanity, so much so that the book of Revelation pictures the end when the new Jerusalem, the place where heaven is now, somewhere out there in the galaxy, somewhere is brought down here to this planet and planted firmly on terra firma because his humanity is united to us. And so he moves his home to be where the lost who are now found will reside forever. Clothed with the robe of the king, brought into the house to dwell with him forever. But the story is marred. The happy ending is marred. By the attitude of the other son, who is still in the household, still in the church. Amongst, apparently, the saved. A son of the king. He does not have the father's heart. In fact, he was glad to see that brother go. And I realize this is a little bit of preacher speculation, but bear with me for a moment. Could it be that maybe he thought to himself, now that the brother's gone, when dad dies, 
It's all me. It's all mine. I don't know. But one thing I do know is he wasn't glad to see his baby brother home. The father had been standing day after day on that porch looking for, hoping for, to see that, that, that familiar gate, that, that familiar figure coming down the road. And when he eventually saw it, boy, he ran out there to put his arms around him and clothe him with the robe of the king. But the brother was not out on that porch. The brother was not out there looking for the lost son. The brother had forgotten all about him. And this son's return to the family was an intrusion. It was an interruption. It was dishonor to the family name. And I wonder if sometimes in our dealing with, with, with souls who come in those doors, with souls we meet in public, the, the looks we give them, the words we say, is that maybe because actually we're moved more by the fear for the dishonor than recognizing the moving of God on their hearts and rejoicing with the Father. Are we more jealous for the family name? Church's name. And I mention this particularly in the context. Particularly in the context of a son who's coming home because a change is already happening in his heart. Any family exercises discipline. We understand that. That's not in contradiction to this picture. But here is a son who's already found repentance. Here is a son who's already returning. Here is a son whose heart has been melted by the remembrance of the father's character and the goodness of his home. And God forbid that you and I would be the look of judgment, the word of accusation, the hurdle that stands between the father and being reunited with one of his sons and daughters. Twenty eleven draws near. Twenty ten has come and passed. Every day you and I walk past, talk to, have business dealings with those in the community who don't do not know that they're searching for God, but they sure do know they want something better. They wouldn't use the term God, but there's a hunger and a thirst that's been placed in their hearts. There are some who, like the son in the last story, to be sure, are not yet at that place and think they've got it all together and think they're living life to the fullest. How do you and I respond to those who desire something better? Who are not necessarily where we are yet or where we think we are. I want to challenge you this morning to ask yourself that question. Are you ready to share the burden of souls? Are you willing to pray the prayer with me that God would place upon us his burden for souls? I'm not asking so much or emphasizing so much how you feel now, but rather looking forward, asking you whether you already share that burden or not. Will you pray the prayer? Will you say to God, I want that burden for souls on my heart. I want you to share with me, however I feel about it now, however much I struggle with it or don't struggle with it, whether I'm indifferent or not indifferent, whatever. Will you at least pray and say, God, give me that character of selflessness. Will you give me that, that Christian principle of disinterest in self and interest in others' well-being? Will you, Lord... However, wherever I am now, will you place on me your burden for souls? Are you willing to have restless nights worrying about someone else instead of restless nights worrying about your situation? Are you willing to, to ask God at least to give you the spirit that you may be willing to be poured out in active service for him? And I must warn you. Don't pray this prayer unless you're willing to be made willing. 
But I hope that every one of us is willing to be made willing. This radical prayer, this outrageous prayer, this insane prayer that militates against every fiber of our natural human nature and being. God, put your burden on me for the lost. Bless me with that spirit of unselfishness and the willingness to labor in your vineyard even at personal cost and expense of energy and of time and of finances and of whatever it takes. Just make me willing, Lord, to pour it all on the altar of sacrifice if that's what it takes because that's what you did for me. That's what you did for me. I want that spirit. I want that willingness. And I pray that you will sing this last song as a song of response. To go where he will lead. To go where he will lead. Thank you.
I invite you to kneel for this prayer. <clears throat> As we have sung those words, Lord, that we'll be what you want us to be, that we'll go where you want us to go, that we'll say what you want us to say. I hope and I pray, Lord, that we have sung that as a genuine response, that we have not lied through song to you and to your Spirit. And I want to ask this morning, Lord, in a special way, that as a church, wherever we have failed you in this regard, that you would forgive us indeed. Wherever as individuals, Lord, we have failed you. Forgive us indeed. And this morning, Lord, on bended knee, we ask for more of your Spirit. Not just more of your power, but more of your Spirit. More of your character more of your love, more of that disinterested in self, attitude of willing service, of sacrifice, that others may know the joy you have given to us. And so, Lord, you have read each heart as we have sung that song. You know how we are crying out to you, Lord, to say that we want to be that community of faith, that community of faith that within a short time here in this little town of Fungarei will be known as the place to go when you need hope, when you need healing, when you need love and friendship, when you need the Word when you need truth, when you need a family, when you need someone to lead you to God, may that be this place. May these people on bended knee before you, Lord, may this be us. And we ask you to make us soul winners for Jesus. Father, will you put upon us Will you put upon us your burden for souls? Will you make it the quest to seek and to save the lost, the all-consuming passion of our lives? May it be the way we choose how to use our finances and use our resources and invest our time and our energy. Will you bless us with the heart of God? In Jesus' name. Amen.